Amen. Great to see each one of you this morning. Hope you've been blessed by the worship. It's time for us to enter into the Word of God. Uh, next week, we have Mani Anand Pagadipali here from India. We're going to be talking about the work of the Lord. You'll be excited about all that, so mark that on your calendar next week uh, to hear about the work in India. <clears throat> the week after that, on the 30th, we're going to have a special worship with worship leader Rick Castleman here. You'll really enjoy that, and we look forward to uh, being together with him. You know, as spiritual leaders of this congregation, we encourage you and teach you from God's Word to fulfill your spiritual obligations, the things that God requires of you. But we also encourage each of us to choose willingly opportunities so that we can grow and serve the Lord. What do I have to do? We all have obligations. We've got obligations to the government. Come April 15, we have to pay our taxes. Well, that's an obligation. You know, we have to obey the laws. We have obligations to our employer. Our employer really does expect us to show up for work at certain times and to do certain things. Those are our obligations. We understand that. We understand that we have obligations to school. We have to go to class. We have to take the test. We have to display a certain level of uh, competence in order to pass. But I do have a duty. I do have obligations to God. I know that that's old hat terminology, my duty to God. But it's biblical terminology. The Bible talks about obligations that we have, duty, expectations, what God requires, what we must do. So what I want to do first of all today, and this is really important, I want you to think with me for a little bit about what every single Christian has as obligations to God. Now, when we become Christians, we have to hear God's word, of course, and, and be convicted and converted by it, put our trust in Jesus, turn to God from sin, confess him as our master and king, and be baptized into Christ. That's how you get into Christ. But once you've done that, there are obligations that we have in order that we might walk in his grace. What are those? Number one... Our obligations to God arise from God's commands. This is really simple, but it's pretty profound. Did you realize that in the New Testament there are over a thousand commands? And a lot of those repeat the same thing in different ways, but there are over a thousand commands. Those are imperatives. That's when God flat out tells us to do things, and he does it in different forms. Sometimes he says, let us, like let us pay more careful attention to the things that we have heard lest we drift away from them. Or let us encourage one another. Those are commands. Sometimes he has a third person imperative. Let each man give as he has purposed in his heart. That's an imperative. That's, that's a command. Uh, sometimes it's just a, in the form of a you do something. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, love your husbands. Children, obey your parents. Those are commands. Sometimes it's uh, just a short imperative like flee from fornication, 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Or flee from idolatry, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 14. The scripture is filled with commands and statements about how we must keep God's commands. Now, is this simple enough? If God commands us to do it, we gotta, we have to. It's an obligation. It's a duty to God. Now let's look at these scriptures again. Leviticus 22, verse 31. God simply says, Keep my commands and follow them. I am the Lord. Why should we keep God's commands? Because He is the Lord God and He is sovereign over all things because He says so. Is that good enough? I mean, He made us. He's our Creator. <clears throat> He's our Redeemer. He's our Judge. Keep my commands. Deuteronomy 4 2. Now watch this. Do not add. To what I command you, and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. We, as the church, as religious people, as spiritual leaders, we have no right to require of you anything in addition to what God has commanded. Nor do we have any right to take away and not require anything that God has required. See, we, we can't take from it, we can't add to it. In Psalm 119, verse 60, 
The scripture says, I will hasten and not delay to obey your commands. You know, some people may ask you, if you're a Christian and you're always worried about doing certain things, they say, why do you think it's so important that you do A, B, C, or D? Like, come to church on a Sunday morning. And you might say, well, because my God in Scripture commands me to do this, and I'm trying to please God. Or someone may have some certain practices that they do that they want you to be involved with, and, and you just won't do it. And they say, what is the deal with you? Why won't you go along with us and do these things? And you say, because God commands me not to do it in his word. You know, it's like when uh, Joseph was being tempted by Potiphar's wife and, and she was trying to get him to commit fornication, to have sex with her outside of marriage. And he said, how can I do this wicked thing against the Lord? See, the Lord says, don't do it. And therefore, I'm not going to do it. It wasn't pragmatic. It wasn't about the circumstances. It was simply because it was a violation of God's commands. In Mark 7, verse 7, the scripture said Jesus was talking. He was actually talking about how people take care of their aged parents or use human traditions to get out of doing that. He said, they worship me in vain. Their teaching are, teachings are but rules taught by men. He was talking about a lot of stuff in the Mishnah that had been added to the law of Moses and sometimes detracted from the very commands that God gave. He says, you have let go of the commands of God and you are holding on to the traditions of men. I think we have a problem right here and in all the churches across the country differentiating between what are the commands of God? What are the commands of Scripture? What does Scripture actually tell us to do? And what are our local traditions, which may be the way we've always done things, which have nothing whatsoever to do with the commands of God. There is a difference, is there not, between our obligations, the things that are commanded, and things which are strictly human traditions or maybe opportunities of one kind or another to do good things. Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 19, go make disciples of all the nations. That's why we think that's the mission of the church, because he commanded it. Baptize them in the name of the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit, and then teach them to obey everything That I have commanded you. The obligations of Christians are right there. Teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Jesus told the apostles. The apostles told us in the pages of the New Testament. The old apostle John in 1 John chapter 1, or 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. He said, we know that we have come to know him, that is to know Jesus, if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him and does not do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is simple, but again, it's profound. What do I have to do? Whatever God commands us to do. Okay? In John 14, verse 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, duh, preacher. You say, I got that. Okay, let's break it down just a little bit more. First of all, under commandments, there are moral obligations. See, obligations means we have to, right? Are we on the same page there? It's a requirement. Moral obligations. Moral behavior. What is right? What is wrong? What is good? What is evil? My moral duty. The basis of my moral values. How I conduct myself on a daily basis. Look at some of these as we break them down. Speak the truth and don't lie. Well, what circumstances should I not do that in? Well, it's, it's beyond circumstances. It's just a moral law. Always speak the truth, don't lie. Be kind to people. That, that applies in any number of thousands of circumstances. Uh, let your speech be always gracious, seasoned with salt, you know, such as good for edifying. This, this is a moral duty that we have. Why do we have to do it? Because God said so. But sometimes I'm in a bad mood and I want to bark at people and be ugly at them. That doesn't mean that God didn't say, let your speech be always gracious. See, that's a command. Encourage one another. That's a command. Be an example to the believers in word, in manner of life, in love. Don't cause anyone else to stumble. That's God's command. See, Uh, those are are, uh, very important. Be sober. Don't be a drunkard. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his own hands. You know it's a command to to support ourselves and work for a living? 
Pay your taxes. Obey law. Do not uh, commit fornication. Those are commands. What those really do is they circumscribe a lifestyle, a path down which Christians walk the way Christians act and the way Christians live. Second category of commands. There are relational obligations we have in Scripture. A bunch of God's commands govern the way we act toward each other. How do we treat our fellow man? How do we treat our family? How do we treat our neighbors? How do we treat our fellow church members? Uh, How do we treat uh, our parents? You know, uh, love your wife, husbands. Ephesians 5.25. Wives, love your husbands. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, that's generic, isn't it? And there's all kinds of different ways we can do that. Love your enemies. Whoa, how do we do that? Love your children. Teach them. Train them. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Those are commands, see? Encourage one another. Be an example. Don't cause others to sin. Put others before yourself, Philippians 2. Look not each of you to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Bear you one another's burdens. Have you thought about these as commands? Commands of God? Greet one another. Well, I don't want to. I just want to walk by you and I don't want to talk to you. I just want to walk by you. Greet one another. Over and over. It's a command. Why does God give us that command? Because we need to show each other that we matter. We need to encourage one another. Greet one another. It's, It's not that hard. Forgive one another. Do I have to? Well, Jesus said, if you don't forgive men your trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. Help the weak. Did you know the Bible says to work hard for your employer like you were working for the Lord? Put in your day's work and do a good job. Why? I don't like him. Because God said for you to. See? And this is what makes a person a Christian. These are the values that circumscribe our life the way we deal with other people. This is a huge and important set of God's commands, relational obligations. And then there are spiritual obligations. You know, there there are commands here. Pray without ceasing. Pray for the kings and all those that are in high places so that we can live a quiet and peaceable life. Let the men pray in every place, lifting up the holy hands without wrath and disputing. There are commands in the scripture to sing. To speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. There are commands to study the Word. Study to show yourself approved. The one that doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly or the way of sinners or the seat of scoffers. His delight is in the law of the Lord. In His law He meditates day and night. Did you know there are commands related to the Lord's Supper? I mean the biggie that's always inscribed in the little tables up front in the church. You know, It says what? Do this. In remembrance of me. That's a command, right? That's an imperative. Do this. In remembrance of me. Let each one of you give as he has purposed in his heart. That's a command. And these commands, some of them are done privately. I mean, you can pray any time of the day or night, anywhere. You can sing a song. But some of these commands are to be done corporately. What does God require? The Sunday worship service, you know. That's that's a requirement. It really is. If I understand Scripture, it is a requirement of Christians. It is an obligation of of Christians that they gather together on the first day of the week and and, uh, take the Lord's Supper. Why is it an obligation? Well, Jesus said, do this, didn't he? Do this, take the Lord's Supper. Uh, Didn't he say, uh, the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 10, talking about how you hold fast your confession and keep your faith, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope that it waver not, for he is faithful that promised. Now listen, and let us consider one another to encourage unto love and good deeds, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but encouraging one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. And then we have the examples that support these commands, like Acts 20 and verse 7, on the first day of the week, which was called the Lord's Day, by the way. When the disciples came together to break bread. Didn't Jesus say, do this in remembrance of me? Paul preached to them. So we've got the commands. We've got the example that supports the command, see? And so this is what God expects us to do. This is our obligation. It's rooted in commands. Even the command to give. Have you noticed in 1 Corinthians 16? On the first day of the week. 
Let each one of you lay by him and store it. Why is that on the first day of the week? Because that's the day that God, not man, set aside for us to come together. And that's where he told us to take the Lord's Supper and to sing to one another. And by the way, when it says, let the men pray in every place, lifting up holy hands, that phrase, lifting up holy hands, comes out of the Mishnah. The men who led the, lifted up the holy hands in the synagogue were the ones who led the prayers in the synagogue. See, that's talking about public worship. That's talking about when you come together. So we have this obligation. Now, we've talked about moral obligations, the commands that, that circumscribe our moral behavior. We've talked about relational obligations, those commands that dictate how we're supposed to treat each other, the people in our family, our neighbors, etc. And we've talked just a little bit about spiritual obligations, you know, pray, sing, study, teach, all that kind of thing, which are commands both to the church leaders and to those that are, that are following, okay? But now what about spiritual initiative? You young people know what initiative is? If you don't, you need to figure it out. Initiative. Have your parents ever used that word and you look at them like, what? What's that? You know? Initiative is when nobody has told you specifically to do it, but you just see something good that needs to be done, and so you just take it upon yourself to go ahead and, and go beyond. Maybe there's something at work that, that your boss told you to do, but then you see some other thing that needs to be done. Like, like maybe there's somebody spills something on the ground and nobody told you to do it, but, but you think it needs to be cleaned up, and so you just do it. That's initiative, okay? But what about spiritual initiative? Love your neighbor as yourself. You can have initiative on that one all day long, right, Con? There's all kinds of ways you can think of to do that. What about study to show yourself approved unto God, you know? Yeah, we're supposed to come together on the, on the first day of the week, but what about add to your faith moral excellence and to your moral excellence knowledge and, and that command that says grow in the grace and, and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? So in addition to the commands or obligations or stuff that God says that you have to do, there are opportunities that Christians ought to take advantage of to grow and to serve. Now, I want to make a distinction here. These specific opportunities are not commanded. This is not something that if you don't do one of these, you're going to go to hell if you don't do it, okay? These are not God's commands, but they are opportunities in which we can fulfill some of the generic obligations. And there are infinite number of these opportunities. Let's talk about some of those. They're choices. Let's talk about specific opportunities. Our leaders here, our spiritual leaders, place a high premium and a high priority on Bible classes. You know why they do that? Because... There are so many commands in Scripture about teaching the Word, preaching the Word, the fact that the seed of God's rule in our life is the Word of God, the fact that we're to study to show ourselves approved, the fact that the way God works in our hearts is through the Word. Since there are so many commands about that, our elders provide the opportunities of these Bible classes because somehow, some way, I don't know how or where or when, but really, God expects every Christian to grow in the Word of God, to develop in the Word of God. And He expects leaders like preachers and elders and everything to teach. He tells us over and over again, until I come, uh, give attention to public reading of the Scripture, to preaching and the teaching. Well, who am I supposed to teach it to? Myself? You know? Uh, and, and, and He tells, uh, be not many of you teachers but he tells the, the, the elders to be sure and teach and convict the gangsters. So if that's so important to teach, then we need to be teaching people and people need to be learning. So the Bible classes are very important. Now, there's Bible classes different times. There are Sunday morning Bible classes. The elders and, and me and everybody else, we would love for you to be a part of one of those and really invest yourself in it. No, the Bible doesn't say if you don't go to a Sunday morning Bible class, you're going to hell. But it's an opportunity to grow in the Word. Wednesday evening Bible classes, same, same. It's a great opportunity. You need to find an opportunity that you can really dig into. There's maybe uh, the Thursday morning ladies' classes. There's other types of classes. But somehow, some way, 
If you're going to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to be plugged into the Word. I know many of you are plugged into the Word privately. You read your Bible every day. That's wonderful, see? But this is, these are opportunities that you have to have the wisdom to pick from, uh, things that you want to do. Another priority in our leaders' minds for opportunities that we have is our small groups. Now, Barry's going to be having a lot to say about those in the coming weeks. Why are, do the elders here think small groups are such a big deal? The Bible doesn't command small groups. But what the Bible does command is that we encourage one another, that we love one another, that we help one another, that we pray with one another and for one another. And these small groups are one of the settings most effectively where we can build these spiritual relationships and people can really get connected with some other Christians and they can be accountable and they can grow. See, that's why the elders think those are so important. We encourage you to pick one. We encourage you to be involved in one of those. Uh, the commands bear one another's burdens. You know, those can be fulfilled in those. There's all kinds of service opportunities in those. Uh, it would be great if you would pick one of those. You know, there are different kinds of small groups around here. I think the seniors group is a type of small group that gives that kind of support. And uh, maybe some ladies' classes have that kind of a, a synergy in them as well. But these are just different opportunities. They're prayer groups that we have. It would be great for you to participate in one of those. But you know what? There's so many things going on at Broadway. Let's just get real with this. There's so many jillions of things. You can't be involved in every one of those things. You wouldn't have time to have a family if you were involved in every one of the things that's offered at the, through the Broadway Church of Christ. And God, in His commands, does not obligate you to be involved in every single thing that goes on at the church at Broadway. Are we on the same page here? Elders, let me hear an amen. All right. So if we're on the same page. But, but God wants us to fulfill our obligations, which are the commands. And then He gives us these choices of opportunities that we can pick from. And, and surely, if we're going to really take spiritual initiative, we're going to pick some opportunities as well. And we leave that up to the discretion of individual people. Take this one, for example, Galatians 6.10. As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially to them that are the household of faith. But I can testify that there are millions of opportunities to fulfill that command. You just have to pick some, see, and do good unto all men. You may find somebody tomorrow morning uh, on your journey around town that needs some help. Take the opportunity. To do good. Now, our, one last scripture. Look at Ephesians 5, verse 15 through 17. This is the bottom line. Be very careful then how you live. What does that mean? That means I need to be living day to day to try to fulfill my obligations, which are based on the what? Church. The commands of God. So be very careful then how you live, not as wise, but as unwise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Everybody in this room is different. Everybody comes from a different background. Everybody has different uh, obligations with family and finances and work and everything. The one size does not fit all, okay? But make the most of opportunities. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will is. Of the Lord is. What does God want me to do? What does He require me to do? And how can I take the most advantage of the opportunities I am able to take to grow in His will and to serve? Well, I hope we'll take this to heart. And if we can help you today to obey the gospel of Christ, or if we can pray with you about something, please come as we stand together and sing our song.